so next I'm going to unbegin um, by just uh, 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 the brief but outlining to you how to derive the equation that I wrote up at the end, which related the response function of the interactive system to that of the conscience system. Right? I'm just, uh, I'll put in most of the steps, but um, I'll, I'll show you how that's done. And then I'll turn to the actually what I'm supposed to be talking about now, which is memory and TDFT. And here's a brief plan. I'm going to tell you a little bit what we mean by memory. Uh, in fact, there's two sources of memory, so I'll talk to you about those sources. Then, in fact, most approximations completely neglect this memory dependence, and they're adiabatic. I'll tell you what that means. Uh, both for the kernel and the linear response regime, as well for the full uh, nonlinear version of TDFT. And then discuss uh, uh, some attempts uh, to go beyond the adiabatic approximation and the relevance of exact conditions when we're doing this. Okay, so first, um, so we'll, turn, we'll, get, we'll get back to the plan later. Let me first uh, outline how we got that equation that I put up at the end. So you might remember that we had this function here. Um, which we had defined uh, that came out of the response theory as this. And what we want to do is find out, you know, of course, as we said, we can't get this in its full glory, right? And then we do all the wave functions, interacting wave functions. We want to get it from the Conchamp system, so we need to relate it to chi s. So, how do we do this? Well, firstly, what we can do is and we, we notice that chi s, as you might remember, chi s here is the same kind of thing but with delta v s. So the one thing, first thing we can do is, is we can try to use the functional derivative, a uh, functional chain rule, to get the chi s into this expression. So we start like this, we go delta m r t, delta v s, r prime t prime, uh, delta v s, r prime t prime, and then delta v external. And d cubed r1 d2. So that all that is is the functional chain rule. Right. Um, okay. But why did we do this? Well now you see we have this this is chi s. And actually I should be a little more precise here, right? So when we do this, let's put in our how do we evaluate these things? We're evaluating this around a V external that's corresponding to this ground state density. And here again, this we evaluate it around VSs at the ground state density, and so on. V external, just to put in where we're evaluating functional derivatives uh, around. OK, so now so we have this, as we said, right? So this term here is how we defined minus. So all we need to do is evaluate this term. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Right. So I I I I poke the system at r prime t, and I ask what happened to the density at r t exactly. And so yeah. Yes. So just to be sure you integrate um, over what. Yes, so, uh, so here, so in the functional chain rule, when you uh, look like the normal chain rule, except you have all these extra yeah, integrals, okay. yeah. So, so, you, so I'm integrating over R1 and T1. T1, okay, great. Yeah, so that's this T1. Okay, so, so what we have to do is figure this out here. Uh, but we know how to express Vs in terms of, we know an expression for Vs as V external plus V hard three plus Vxc. So we're just going to take each of those terms and functionally differentiate them. Right, so we have Vs as equal to V external plus V heart tree plus Vxc. And so the first one, so we have now, then we want, so we want delta by delta V external of all of these things, right? Right, this is R1, T1, R1, T1, etc. right? And this here I want me to derive R prime T prime. Okay of this expression. Okay, so let's just take each term by term. The first term is relatively easy because it's the same functional. And so just thinking about what this means, if you take the functional derivative of itself, you just basically get one, the identity. In other words, delta R1 minus R prime, delta T prime, T1 minus T prime. That's this functional derivative. What about V hard tree? So let's do that somewhere else. 
So we want here delta V hard tree of N of R1 T1 over delta V external R prime T prime. So let's first write what this is. Well, it's delta by delta V external R prime T prime of the integral N of, uh, let's call it R2, T2, oh, T1. And then we go R1 minus T1, right? So this is, sorry, R1 minus R2, right? That's just the heart tree potential. And I should integrate over R2, right? So now we imagine taking, so this is the definition of V heart tree at R1, T1, right? And we'll enter it in this So now we imagine taking the functional derivative, and you can see that it's only going to really operate on this term here, and now we recognize something familiar. We have again a delta n by d at delta v external. So you can see we're going to get chi here, right, with different arguments, but it's essentially just chi. Okay. So, we, so this will give you a chi. And I said I would just outline it so I don't take too long, <laughs> right? So let me just I'll, I'll just uh, write it, and then you can uh, figure out the details. And then, yeah, so you, okay, and then you get R1 minus R2. Right? So you get something like this, okay? Okay, so now we get the tricky part. Uh, we get this, now we have to turn to the, perhaps the, oh, I, I wasn't right it's here. Okay, we're going to turn to this term here, right? And here it's more complicated, but not so much more complicated. So we have, Delta V X C as a function of n zero at R one T one over delta V external at R prime T prime. And then we say, okay, what do we do with this? Well I'm not sure because this is a function of n zero. So the first thing we can do is, well, let's let's do a functional derivative and just take a functional derivative step. Sorry, let's do a, 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 a functional chain rule, right? But and, and put an n zero in there because I'm supposed to know this functional as a function of n zero, right? So this we just take another integral, in other words, right? So we get um, to be at c n zero r one t one by delta n, uh, or I can just uh, at R2 T2, okay. delta N at R2 T2 by delta V external. And this is D R2, uh, D T2. So again, we see, we recognize this is our friend, this uh, that we met just earlier today, this chi of R2 T2. R prime T1, uh, T prime, and but this is now a new object. Okay. This object is the central uh, ingredient, if you like, that's coming from T D D F T, right? The T D part of the linear response is the what we call the exchange correlation kernel. So this term we define it as F X C, which is the exchange correlation kernel. So that's what that said. That's it. So then if you, so now we've sort of identified all the different pieces, right? And now if you go back and you stick, if you just put that into, into this expression, you'll find the expression that I wrote down this morning after we talked about response functions, right? Which I boxed and said this is the central equation. How do we get chi from the Cauchy system? And you can see, uh, I, I, I didn't really mention that this morning, but from the equation, so you, this is, I, I'll write it in a sloppy uh, notation here without um, really, uh, it has this structure, right, where these are various integrals, right, so I'll just look from the morning, um, the AM lecture, right, um, but you, and you can fill in the details, but this is this kind of structure, right, so you can see that two, there's kind of two stages, if you like, or two ingredients, right? One of them, so two uh, steps, right? And doing linear response. One of them is finding, as actually as one of you in the questions was uh, uh, clarified also. Well, firstly, we find the ground state, Konchan system, 
Right? We find the ground state Vs corresponding to N0. You find here all the ground state orbitals, phi i, epsilon i, and their excitation energy levels. Right? And then you apply the exchange correlation kernel in this way. Okay, and as I said before, in fact, if you look at your quantum chemistry codes or uh, uh, codes for finite systems, you'll find that instead of this equation, you solve uh, you actually are solving for eigenvalues and eigenvectors of a matrix equation. You can show how to get, uh, in fact, that matrix equation um, this is sometimes called Casida's equation. You, uh, one can derive it from starting from this point, and if you're interested in seeing the derivation, I can uh, point you to a couple of references after this. Yes. Um, just to reassure everyone, the last term when you uh, wrote F H, um, hard uh, exchange correlation, then we do agree that this part will define the exchange, and this part is a hard exchange Thank you. Yes, I didn't say that. Thank you for clarifying that. Yes, so F H X C, yes, this is F H plus F X C, just as you said, and this term, in the, in the, if, I, if I take Fourier transform to frequency, it's just this, right? Yeah, if I keep it in the time domain, then I have a delta function, so I'm sitting on top here, but we're not doing that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yes. The external and the functional of N zero. Uh, yeah. The yeah. first line. Uh -huh. uh, the limit. Yes. The yes. So that's the external potential that can give rise to N zero as a ground state density. Exactly. Yeah. Precisely that. Yes. Uh, time dependent. Time independent. Time independent ground state. state. Yes. And that's important because we need to have that that the cone sham system is, is is in mind the same ground state density. So the Vs here is for that density ground state. The V external is for that, dense, that ground state density. Right? So these are, then we have to correlate the two. So I can have a cone sham system, density response, and I have an interacting system density response. What links them is the ground state density around which we are responding. OK. Um, OK, so then, so yeah, and as I said, if you want to hear, if you want to know a bit more about uh, how this is actually coded up, or how, it's written, how do you turn into matrix vision, I can give you references. Um, also, sort of uh, interesting aspects of the kernel uh, analytic properties um, we, I can discuss later. But otherwise, I would like to uh, move on to the memory part. Okay, so perhaps I, I move on to memory Okay, so I'll keep this up for a minute. Um, so, yeah, so what I'm going to talk to you about today is an aspect of TDDFT that's neglected um, in almost all uh, calculations that are happening. And um, there are some consequences of this, um, and uh, I'll, I'll mention some of that. Um, it's, it's actually a little bit, I'd say it's quite remarkable that TDFT works as well as it does without memory dependence, and I would say it's partly understood but not completely. Um, and and, and I'll, I'll, uh, maybe some of this will, will come up as we well. So, but first of all, I should tell you what I mean by memory, right? So, what do we mean by memory? So, remember, uh, let me just turn the page in my notes, I don't repeat the linear response stuff. Okay. So, memory. Okay, so, I, so let me just check this off. So, you know where we are? Okay, so now I'm going to talk about memory. Okay, so, uh, memory. What is memory? So we recall from Heidi's lecture this morning, he proved, or he showed, he, he outlined to us that there's a one-to-one -one mapping between the time evolving density of the system and the external potential that it's evolving in for a given initial state. Now, if we want to be careful, what we really should, how we should describe this mapping is like this, one-to-one, -one, but I need to put my initial state in there. Does it mean because as as okay so one thing so this is B and I'll call it B external right um, so so this means right what does this mean it means B external is a functional of this time dependent density but it is also a functional of the initial state this is important because it means that if you change your initial state your functional is a different functional right it's a different number. Or, or function. I'll come back to this in a minute. Of course, in practice, we never care really about the external as a function of the density because we're handed to that, we're handed that in the, as by the problem at hand. You know, we're given the laser field, right? So we just put that in our code, right? 
What we need to know is the functional, derivative, uh, functional dependence of the exchange correlation potential. How do we get this? Does that depend on the initial state? Which initial state? Okay, to understand that, let's apply Hardy's theorem now to the cone sham system. So we just wrote the same thing. There's a one-to-one -one mapping for non-interacting systems as well, which depends on the initial cone sham state. This state, we are actually free to choose. It doesn't need to be a selected determinant. If you start in a ground state, it's natural to choose it as the ground state, corresponding to the external potential of the quantum field. But if you don't, you don't have, and in fact, you even don't have to, right? The point is, again, that the functional Vs, as a function of n, depends not only as a function of n, but also on this choice of Kohn-Sharp state. OK, again, we never. As a function, we never really care about, about this because what we care about is when we're doing a calculation, we, we, we need to approximate not Vs, not the external. We need to approximate Vxc. We're given the external as a functional, right? So uh, let me just write this out. What does this mean? So Vs, if we write down the cohn sham potential, right? You can write it like this plus V Hartree. V Hartree doesn't have any initial state dependence because it's just a classical distribution to, to charge. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Well, no, no, please. please. Yeah. Um, why does VXT depend as a functional of N? Why is the external functional of N? Yeah. Oh, well, just in the same way that um, even in the ground state, right, if I think about the, ex uh, if, I'm, uh, if I think about the convert cone theorem, right, the, if you're given the density, it points to your external potential. Right, so this is in the same way the external potential is a function of n. We never use that function derivative uh, dependence. And I'll, I'll, I'll clarify. Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, when we are uh, when we are studying the interacting system, yes, we are taking psi zero as the initial state, which is the ground state. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. So, for example, some of some of the applications even hardly mentioned, but you might begin your calculation like if you're doing some kind of photo excited dynamics. You might begin your simulation in the excited state. You assume that you're already excited and then you evolve, right? So then your psi zero is an excited state, right? Then you wouldn't use ground state DFT or anything to get your initial potential on, right? Okay, and let me just and so then we have this VXC. But yes, you're right, in many cases and in linear response, we take the ground state. And this is why in linear response, I didn't thus at all with functional derivatives, uh, sorry, with functional dependence on the initial states. Okay, so we can see, so why am I writing this, right? So we understood this from the mapping, we understood this from the mapping, mapping applied to the non-interacting system, mapping applied to the interacting system. This is just Hartree, right? They're just the classical uh, electrostatic solution. But then what must the functional dependence here be? Well, we see that there's a final here and a sign up there. And, and yet these other terms don't have final sign up, et cetera. So this must depend on both of them, right? So this here is, this is important because this is the thing we need to approximate. So we need to know its functional dependence, right? So this here, um, so yeah, so this, uh, let me write, in practice, who cares, right? So in practice, um, who cares? Uh, uh, because um, the external of RT is given to us uh, by the physical problem we're trying to solve, right? E.g. laser field, right? So we just we just plug that into our calculation. We don't have to find the functional group uh, dependence. But this we do because we need to know uh, this, right? So okay, so we need this. So this, um, this. So what we call this is initial state dependence. Uh, and I'm going to just um, call that ISD so I don't have to keep writing it on the board. And we'll talk a little bit about this initial state. Dependence. So, initial state dependence. Okay, so 
Um, yeah, so I, I mentioned briefly, but I, I realize I didn't explain it. So if you start in the ground state, and as, um, as the question was, right? If you start in the in ground state, in fact, we don't need uh, we don't need uh, initial state dependence. Why, so why is that? Anybody can tell me why? Why? why I mean, I, I think I, I asked your question saying because like you don't need it, right? But I didn't explain why you don't need it. Right? So why is it? Yeah, it would depends on. Yeah, you're saying because. Can you clarify? Well, well, if you're given the density, you can automatically get what your initial state was. Yeah, your ground state. Right, right exactly. Good. Yeah. Um, because, yeah, exactly. Because um, of the Holmberg Cone Theorem, right? Uh, the Holmberg Cone Theorem, everything, including the wave function, is a functional of this ground state density. Okay, so we don't need that. Um, and as I said, so how do you choose these things? Well, usually psi naught, uh, this, this is given uh, by the problem at hand, right? Because it's whatever you're starting your, um, your state in, right? So like the initial value of your Schrodinger equation, right? The initial value. But what about phi naught? In fact, we can choose it, um, but can choose uh, the phi naught. Uh, to be any state, any wave function, it doesn't even have to be a slightly determined. It could be any wave function such that the density of phi naught is equal to the density of the true initial state and the first time derivative is the same. And why, can anyone tell me why this condition is, is, is important and or even possible. Yeah, so so we, so I, I'm saying that you can choose any initial state for the conscious state. Well but of course we have to reproduce the initial density, right? Because otherwise we're we're not matching at all from the beginning, from the get go. But I'm saying you also need to ensure that n dot is the same. And and the reason is, right? Yeah, you need the same density evolution. And in fact, the information about n dot is contained in the initial wave function because of the equation of continuity. Right? N double dot? No. N double dot, that depends on what V is. But the first derivative, who cares what your V is? It's gonna if you if you have your state and you apply, apply a million different Vs to it, they're all gonna have the same n dot because that information is a property only of the instantaneous wave function. Okay. So um so this since n dot is minus divergence of j, and as we wrote this morning, the j uh, is, just depends on your state, right? Okay, so this is um so what's interesting about this is that then different choices choices of phi naught give you very can can give you different VXEs. And if you want to see some examples of this, tonight go see Leonel's poster. Leonel, do you want to wave your hand up so then we go? He does want to wave his hand up. Okay, he's there sitting in the room. So he has one example, because where we're studying some of these effects. Um, and you can see the difference in the potentials um, um, at, at when you change your initial state. Right. And you, when you, you have an initial interacting wave function, actually, I think it's a 50 50 superposition of two states, and he chooses two different uh, possible cone sham states, and he shows the difference in the potentials as they evolve. Right? So you get different states, right? Okay, so this is a thing, right? Uh, um, again, and we'll, we're going to discuss how this initial state dependence is treated in practice uh, shortly. And by most calculations, in fact, it's completely neglected, <laughs> so uh, it's very easily treated. Right? Uh, but and we'll come back to that. Um, but okay, so this is one source of memory, right? But history is another source of memory. Maybe I start to that here. So, so another source of memory is what we call history dependence, and that is a fact, which actually hardly uh, discussed this morning, um, that the, the potential at time t depends uh, not just on the uh, density of time t, but on its entire history. Okay. Um, history depends. 
Uh, okay, so this is another source of menu. Because Vxc of n uh, R and T depends on n at T prime early at T, like the health function. And in fact, um, in fact, ISD and history dependence are entangled. In fact, you should really shouldn't try to derive an approximation that includes history dependence without including initial state dependence, because you're going to violate a sort of time translational invariance of the whole problem, which I'll, I'll try and explain. Um, so uh, I, I won't go into too much detail, but the thing is that if you look at VXC, and let's say we, we, we have some evolution in time, uh, and, and, and we, you know, let's say the density does something like this, right? Um, we could, let's say we evolve just for some time tau, and we stop the calculation and we look at what the wave functions are, psi at, at time tau, uh, that we label it with a subscript, and phi at time tau, right? Here I have psi at time zero and phi at time zero, right? I, if I knew these things, and of course in a normal uh, calculation we don't have this access, so we're thinking to the more as a get out of an experiment, right? If we knew these things, then we know that the VXC should be independent of this choice. Like we should be able to think of these are initial states and think about the history as evolving from this time onwards. Right? And, is, and this is something that Kieran, when I was in uh, postdoc in Kieran's group, I, I worked on with him. And this is something uh, that led back in 2002. So again, if you're interested in this stuff, I can give you some references. OK, so this should be independent of tau. Okay, so this, um, what do I mean here? So this, this n of t is a density function that is defined from time tau onward. Right, so it's kind of this, right? So if I take this and these in blue as my arguments, I should get the same as the black arguments, right? Take this and this. And you can kind of see that if you have some approximation that doesn't have initial state dependence, but it does have some history dependence, you're most likely going to violate those conditions. They go hand in hand. Yeah. Uh, I didn't get clearly how you're saying that it's independent of tau, because here the is a function of the density at tau and psi and phi at tau. Yes, so this is the, this is a fun, this here. I could, so this, this is a, um, so maybe, maybe I could write, this should be equal to Vxc at n psi zero plus zero, right? So we, this is the one we usually think about, right? We have our initial states of the normal time, that's the blue thing, right? Or the black one, right? Mm -hmm. And then my n function is defined all the way from zero onwards up to time t here, right? But if I could kind of stop the evolution here and restart it, mm -hmm. so I know my, say if I know my wave functions at this time, then I, I might as well just take this as my initial oh, okay. time. And then provided I'm asking myself about the time after this time, it shouldn't matter which which functional I use. Mm -hmm. I should get the same answer. Okay, good. Um, okay, so this is that's, uh, this is what I want to say about formal aspects uh, of memory. Uh, sorry, I'm going to this off. <laughs> However, I'm going to come back to some other formal aspects. Um, of memory, when, we, when I tell you about sometimes to go beyond the exact approximation, there are some of the other exact conditions which are particularly important uh, in, the con in the numerical implications of violation that are violated by these, right? So I will, I, and those are exact conditions articulate to the time dependent case, and they also uh, uh, indicate uh, memory in the exact functional. So I'm going to, uh, so for now, we put this aside. I'll tell you first about what most calculations do, adiabatic approximation, and then I'll tell you about some attempts to go beyond that. Uh, any questions before I keep going? Okay, so what do we do? Well, most calculations, they do an adiabatic approximation where all of, mem all of the memory dependence is neglected. So, um, neglects. 
all of memory. So I could write it like this. In fact, more than that, uh, in particular, uh, more specifically, I mean more specifically than that, what happens in, in how we define and, and this definition of main value approximation, you just pick a ground state functional and you put your instantaneous density in there as if as if it was a ground state. Uh, yeah, as if it was a ground state. Now most densities actually of many body systems don't have nodes, right? So you could imagine that they are a ground state, a density of a ground state. But it could also be, and mostly when you're doing dynamics, it's not. The underlying wave function is not a ground state. The density could be that of a ground state, but the wave function is not. Right? And so this has a, this is quite a drastic approximation. Okay? But this is what most calculations do. What's one, one thing nice about this approximation is by default it satisfies this exact condition. So I should, yeah, this is an exact condition to do it. I mean, this is because it has no memory. So adiabatic approximation satisfies it. So that's kind of nice. But for useless, I mean, well, or trivial, I should say. Okay, so what about the, and I said also earlier that most of the approximations happen in the linear response regime. So then what does this mean for the kernel? In linear response, then, it means that fxc, the adiabatic um, approximation, um, RT, R prime T prime. Um, so remember what this is, we just wrote it up. This is like this, R and T, delta N, R prime T prime, as in we evol uh, evaluated around the ground state, right? So now if we have if we do this, if we put now this approximation in here, right? If we now put this approximation in here, then you can see that since it depends only on the instantaneous density, you get a delta function popping out, right? So you end up getting, in fact, delta, uh, delta function in time, and then just the second derivative of um, the exchange correlation energy. That that your your ground state approximation uh, is 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 uh, using. Right? That's what you get. And so then in particular in the frequency domain, which is where we're running our calculations and et cetera, Fourier transform it to, from time to frequency of a delta function is what? If you Fourier transform a delta function, what do you get? Uh, uh, yeah. I think I heard it. Yeah, I think, yeah, and I think you heard it. Yeah, constant, right? Exactly. No frequency dependence. So in fact, it's just exactly this is no frequency dependence gone, right? Actually, I ran out of time, as you know, in the first lecture to tell you about the implications of this this approximation, but that maybe I can mention now. The implication of this is that you cannot build in multiple excitations into your into your state, right? So you remember how we said that F, we did, I did discuss a little bit that FXC mixes up your single excitation to the current sham system. Without frequency dependence, you can only get states of single excitation character. You can't get double excitations. And again, if you're interested in references, I can give you some. Okay. Okay, so there's no frequency dependence, all right? Um, now, the other point to make, actually, I wanted to say that the exact uh, yeah, I just wanted to, because I didn't say that the exact FXC, and it's real, um, so no frequency dependence, and real. But the exact FXC is frequency dependent and complex. And, and, and in fact, these things go hand in hand because of analyticity properties, because of famous chronic relations, which again, I don't know. Okay, so let's just uh, do an example, our favorite approximation, ALDA, etc. AG and ALDA, right? So VXC, um, ALDA, is, if you, if you put this in, you put in that uh, exchange correlation energy of a uniform electron gas here, and so typically it's written like this, D by DN of N times the exchange correlation energy per particle of a uniform gas. 
um, and it's evaluated at the instantaneous density. Right? So this is the Xc energy uh, per particle of the unicorn electron gas. And Fxc, that is just a functional derivative. And omega, but there's no omega dependence. It's just D2. <coughs> Sorry, so this is a, a functional derivative, I meant the second derivative. Okay. Okay, so you can see, and I, again, I won't talk too much about this because I actually add them. Where are you? Oh, yeah. How much time do I have? Um, we have um, eight minutes, 445. Okay, all right. So I won't say anything about the exact data. I just want to make one point here that you can see that there's two sources of error that are entering in the adiabatic approximation. One is simply the fact that we're neglecting memory, but the other is what, it, what is the choice of ground state approximation we put in here. And so when it's possible to actually find the exact ground state uh, functional, in other words, with simple model systems, it can be extremely useful to analyze the effects of, how, of, of the error that's purely due to make the adiabatic approximation, right? Because we're using the exact process, the best adiabatic approximation can be. And again, if you're interested in references to that, I can give you uh, some. Uh, 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 up with, um. Okay, so adiabatic approximation, we're done. Now I want to talk about going beyond. <coughs> and I'm going to start off, uh, and probably won't get much beyond, on this with a, an early approximation. Um, in fact, hardly realized very early that the memory was important. <laughs> and the year after he derived this theorem, he and Walter Cohn came up with a, a, a memory-dependent approximation, which is called the gross cohn functional. It has a very similar spirit to LDA. In fact, one could call it a finite frequency LDA. And I'll write that, what that is now. And then as we study it, we're going to find, we're going to come up with other exact conditions, as I mentioned, um, that in fact, play a role particular to the TD time dependent case. But in fact, unfortunately, this, this uh, approximation violates. And then I'll mention to you, but won't give you any detail, about attempts to incorporate those exact conditions in the spirit of gross cone in a sense, right? But now with these exact conditions built in and, and, uh, and what, what they are doing at this point, right? Okay, but first, what is the gross cone approximation? So I would call this, if you like, a finite frequency LDA. Um, so you uh, let me write it down and I can write this. R, okay. So first one, then come to the end zero. R, R final again. Yeah. Um, local in space, right? Because LDA, right? So you have a local in space. We take the uniform kernel, but we and we stick in the density, right? At that point, right? Uh, the ground state density of our inhomogeneous system. But this FXC kernel of the uniform gas, it depends on frequency, right? And also on wave vector, like how uh, the spatial variation of your perturbation, if you like. So what they do is they take Q equals zero, right, and omega. And this is gross cone. So Q, Q is the Fourier transform is a wave vector, right? This is a wave vector, so it's the Fourier transform of the R minus R prime. And the uniform gas is only this difference that matters, so you just have one wave vector that you can do. Okay, so so in some sense you're assuming also a slow perturbation, because you're taking only the Q equals zero, right? Where um, thing. So you're assuming a slow, sorry, I mean slow in space. A slowly varying perturbation on a slowly varying, uh, sort of on an inhomogeneous but slowly varying system. And this is the gross cone, right? Okay. Um, and, uh, okay. So the problem, and then, so this might be very nice, right? And you, we know these kernels and so on, right? And to some extent, right? One can get this. But the problem is that this violates um, um, exact conditions. Uh, conditions that are particular to the time dependent case. Time dependent case. And 
notably um, the harmonic potential theorem, which I'm going to abbreviate as HPT, and the zero force theorem. ZFT. And let me tell you a little bit about these theorems, because I think they're quite interesting. So the harmonic potential theorem, um, this was uh, uh, yeah, due to Dobson in 1994, and Vignali in 1995, um, there's a, and this, he has two papers, um, one on harmonic potential theorem, one with your course theorem, so, uh, but this, in this one, he, he shows essentially that it's a, a special case of what he calls generalized transition invariance, so I would, uh, it's a final But anyway, essentially this states, this states, this states that if you have a bunch of electrons, n electrons, n electrons sitting in the, either the ground state or any stationary state, in fact, of a harmonic potential, parabolic well, and then you turn on, uh, or you have also present, a uniform field, uniform field that oscillates in time. Okay, so, we, so we imagine identity, an electron, so this is the n electron density, which is initially either in the ground state or station or any excited state effect, and it's in a harmonic potential. So the, poten the external potential is purely harmonic. There are interacting electrons, so there's the repulsion, and then there's a uniform field, right? That does this, right? Back and forth. Okay, so what happens to the density is it actually just oscillates back rigidly, right, like this, but without distorting. The oscillations are those of the center of mass as predicted classically in the system. Right? So this is exact, right? So and so you can show, can prove um, that um, density rushes back, back and forth, rigidly, and the rigidly is the clue to saying what the exceed, exceed potential is going to do rigid, uh, with. Uh, classical oscillations with with the center of mass center of mass making oops making classical oscillations. So you could say n of R T if you like is n of R minus R center of mass T. This also means then that V X C is V X C of R minus R center of mass T. And this is violated in gross cone. Why, and well, here's one way to understand why, 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 why one might expect it could be violated. Let's think about how, what the gross cone is doing, right? So we have the density. Let's say the density here is time zero, right? Um, this is R, and let's say we're first it's local. Let's, so here's this is local, right? So let's 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 say we're just looking, and this is just a heuristic argument, right? So um, okay, so um, Actually, I want to move R0 just for the purposes of my picture. I'll just move it out to leave it so that it's a bit less. Um, okay, so I'm going to have my R0 here. Right? I'm going to be looking. Remember, gross cone takes local in space, but it allows for frequency, right? Time to time. So this, this, imagine if this actually is able to move over, right? So after some time, it rigidly moves over, and let's say its peak is here. I'm going to draw it in a different color. Then. So this is time zero, uh, black is time zero, and this is like some time t, t. So you can see that if we're looking rigidly, then we can see, oh, sorry, if we're looking just locally, we see that the density has increased locally. And in fact, we can, uh, the gross code that cannot distinguish whether this is simply a rigid moving rigid motion of density or some local compression or it's later a re re rarefaction, right? Yes? Uh, the density is uh, you mean the area under the curve or the line? Um, I mean the, the line. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So, this is so I'm just drawing hand and arm. 
Okay, so yeah. Okay, so the thing is that if you're looking locally, you can't finish on a. Uh, okay. All right. So I, I hurry up here. Okay. So so the thing is, the gross con looks only locally. Uh, locally. Uh, so can't distinguish. Um, okay. So can't distinguish. Yeah, can't, can't, can't distinguish the, um, the sloshing, sloshing with compression refresh. Compression, that's it. Okay. There's another theorem that I will quickly mention because um, I think it's actually kind of interesting, and then I will uh, then I'll just I'll just I will be done in maybe uh, three minutes. <laughs> you know, I just want to mention um, the names at least of some functions which have gone beyond this approximation. Uh, so, but I think this is so. This is so. Another thing is the zero force theorem, and um, a couple of references here in the TDDFT context in Yale '95. But in fact, Mal also has a paper. Um, he didn't call it the zero force theorem. Ruan and Levy, back in uh, 1990, where they derived essentially the same uh, equal uh, exact condition. Right? And so this is the this is the way that. Uh, uh, I think about it um, is that there's no net force um, exerted by the exchange correlation potential, um, and this is so it's like a Newton's third law, right? So in other words, you you can't self-excite. So third law like, right? So in other words, you have this condition with n of r two uh, gradient of b j c of r t d cubed r must equal zero. If you violate this condition and you imagine that you're trying to run dynamics and this is violated, what ends up happening is you can imagine a lot of numerical instability because as your system is evolving, it might uh, you know, put forces from, you know, from itself, right? The A on B does not cancel B on A and it ends up self-exciting, right? So you can do instabilities. And in fact, I can give you some references where this has been studied with KLI approximation with orbital functionals, which violates this condition, right? Um, and, 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 and you see this numerically. Okay, so I just want to say, uh, just I want to write in the linear response here regime, just, and then I'll try and keep right. So I'll get up to this one. So the linear response regime, I think, is a very interesting um, thing. You can, and you can prove this as an exercise, right? That you can just put in the linear response terms here and do a um, translation to frequency domain. Because what you end up finding is this extremely interesting condition, which I think says a lot about the exact functional. Because it says um, that, uh, just being clear here. In linear response, this is what it says. You have, on the right-hand side, no frequency dependence. On the left-hand side, there's a frequency dependence integrated over space. What this means is that somehow the integral washes out the frequency dependence. In other words, space and time long locality are intricately related to each other in TDDFT, right? Because the integral, up to the integral, you have to get something uh, space, uh, frequency independent, right? So there's, there's, some, there's something kind of deep, I think, in the statement, and Giovanni Vignale has, has really thought about this a lot. Okay, so this um, suggests space uh, and ti uh, space, uh, time. You know, okay, I can write that. Space and time non-locality are intricately related, right? Okay, and this is violated by gross cone. And again, if you want to do it as an exercise, you put in the gross cone function, you can see that it's violated. So, how, what are some attempts to? I'll just take one second, one minute to tell you the attempts. To, you know, the approximations that have gone beyond this. There's a very nice, um, uh, it's not used, right, but there's a very nice idea, which I think uh, was Dobson, Gunner, and Gross. Uh, and this is, and I can give you the exact reference if you like, or I can, I have also a, um, a review kind of article I wrote last year, which has all these references in there, so if you want to have that one, that's fine too. Anyway, this article here, they said, well, they said, well, okay, so we know, we think that the memory clearly depends spatially, not lo locally. But in fact, why not carry the memory along with me? Like in other words, if I think that this block of density was over here at this time, then I'll, I'll apply my, my, my local exchange correlation here, but in a frame that's moving with the density. Right? So sort of memory residing with the fluid element is this idea. 
This is actually very close to um, the Vignale Cohen approximation. And this is the one which has, in fact, seen some uh, actually, this, this has in fact seen some applications, and I can tell you more about that again. This actually technically falls within time-dependent current DFT. The, thing, the picture I just gave you on, as moving, as a memory kind of moving along with the fluid element, suggests we want to do approximations local in the current, not the density. And so, in fact, we just establish a current density functional theory. We might ask, well, doesn't that fall under TDDFT? In fact, for many um, currents and of interacting systems, they're not V-representable. In other words, you cannot find a non-interactive non V-representable. In other words, you cannot find a scalar potential of a non-interacting system which reproduces that current. You can reproduce the longitudinal part, but not the transverse part. In fact, it's a, uh, you can with the vector potential, and this is where the TBC DFT comes in. And in fact, with well, the experience, you can also sh show that um, this, uh, the, the functionals are local approximations to the current are, are work a bit better. Right? So, also orbital functionals, right? So, I'll leave this hanging here. Um, orbital functionals also have non local density dependence because um, you have. Your orbital, if you're looking locally at the function at your orbital, then that depends non-locally in time on the density, right? So you can build a memory like this as well. And in fact, hybrids actually are um, yeah, uh, exact exchange approximations like this have some memory. It's just that it's, it's very difficult to count. they're no good, I would say there aren't any good correlation functionals, which are orbital functionals, right? So this in a lot of the examples um, which I can tell you about which have shown where memory is important involve correlation right so I will uh, I can tell you about that or I can give references about that if you're interested but I should shut up now because my time is up oh, oh, okay, yes so um, for the idiomatic approximations do those conserve both uh, the uh, CFT and HPDPR? Yeah, good, very good question. I meant to say that. Yes, they do. Okay. Yes. So that's part of the reason they have such, such success? You might be right. Yes, I think that's probably, yeah. So by default, it sort of trivially satisfies some of these time dependent. Maybe that's part of it. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, no, no, it's so, uh, so it is different yeah. in the sense that, so ergodicity tends to think about many particle systems and uh, sort of some chaotic element yeah. to the dynamics and stuff like this. And so, it, so in fact, when our interacting system has that in it, like many particles and stuff like this, then in fact, that uh, memory, in fact, to, uh, uh, has two different aspects. There's one which is similar to few particle systems, like the actual memory dependent. The other is relaxation or dissipation. And this is, in some sense, in fact, in those systems, Vignale Cohn works quite well just because it's of the way it's derived from an uh, infinite metallic type system and captures these dissipation events. But generally, memory is more general than, than, than this. Yeah. So, basically, Now, that's a great question. Yeah, so, so technically, um, if we think about the way that we derived this morning the, the linear response equations, it really should be the same functional. Like a ground state one should be the omega going to the zero limit of what you're using for your kernel, right? In practice, people don't do that, right? In practice, for example, the Vignali cover, if this is an energy dependent function, you just kind of add it to, add it to something, right? The LDA is, for example, not the omega going to zero limit of this function, right? So in practice, this, uh, you, you, you do mix and match. Formally, you're not supposed to, <laughs> right? But, yeah. Yeah. I have a complex question. Oh, okay. So, if I accept the frequency of the 
equivalency point zero might yeah. be satisfied by Graham's calibration. Yeah. So then the right hand, the left hand side is zero if I subtract all Graham's thing. Uh, if you subtract off this zero, the ground state. Yeah, the static part. You know, if I look at the difference of the FXCs. Um, so you want to look at um, like uh, something like FXC uh, omega uh, gradient of n minus FXC right. omega equals zero. Yes. Yes, you know, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Zero. So then you'll get these things going to be equal. Right. Yeah. right. I mean, this is some, well, yeah, so then somehow, yeah, so somehow, yeah, this must be related to that. Yes, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah, and I think um, in, in your original result was the omega. Well, actually, you could do with the x. Okay. Oh, yeah. uh, when we are integrating up over space, you mentioned that we are getting rid of the frequency mm -hmm. Yeah. What's the physics there? <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. So I mean, uh, so Giovanni has thought a lot about this, this, this whole issue. And in fact, I pulled this from one of his book chapters. So the thing is that, yeah, so what he would say is that the exact non non adiabatic functional is he uses the term ultra non local, meaning that you know you have this uh, 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 very uh, far away space dependence. Right? So in other words, you need um, you know uh, you need to integrate over all space to actually get this to be frequency independent, as it should be. Right? So yeah, so this is sort of it means sort of it, it kind of suggests that this never dies out. Right? That well, yeah, it's never or, or it dies out to an ultra non local very slow. Yeah, I think you can't. Yeah, I think you need right. I think you need the whole space, right? I mean, it could be. Then I mean, of course, this helps, right? This depending on where you, if you have a finite system and you and I mean, this helps tremendously, especially for finite systems because then it kills off your integral anyway, right? So this also kind of kind of suggests that the the maybe the finite system and periodic system is that's not different from this point of view, right? Again, I, I would say this, you know, we could try to understand this a little more. <laughs> yeah. It's time to move on, but uh, our next speaker has disappeared, so maybe there's time for one more question. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, can you describe more about how the uh, orbital functionals are in my mind? Yeah, sorry. So, yeah, so orbital functionals, right? So something like exact exchange, right, which is kind of, um, you, you, you essentially your your VXC um, depends just directly on your instantaneous orbital, right? Okay, so so then then in some sense in terms of the orbital, it's adiabatic, right? No, no. However, the orbital itself depends. If I think about the density dependence, right? Orbital orbital functionals are implicit density functionals hiding in here. You know, by the Runge Gross theorem is the initial state and the density uh, at earlier times. So in some sense at time t, and if you think about Schrödinger's equation the way it propagates, right, for these for these instantaneous orbitals, it knows about the earlier density, right? Because it's propagated through that from the first term. In fact, it all also has sort of cone sham initial state dependence, if you like, because it's come from a phi i zero, right? So so in some sense this this contains, and instantaneous functions of the orbitals contain non-local in time, uh, so it contains information about history, the density of the history, as well as the initial state, initial Konchan orbitals. Sorry, it maybe wasn't so clear. We can maybe discuss it. Yeah. Okay.